women's sport doesn't need to be compared to men's sport like we can both be amazing at sport one of my goals was always to go to the olympics and when i realized like mm, don't think that's completely likely at this point so i was like why don't i just let go of of the need to try and win all the time i did think to myself little like eight-year-old me down on the track I, I think she would be proud that i was still involved in the sport but that i had just kind of yeah shifted my focus to more um, sharing the stories of others I would look at her and be like I'm a mum I'm your mum like you're gonna call me mum like this is so <laughs> crazy like <laughs> I'm Courtney I am a pre and postnatal coach a personal trainer um, and then I'm also a runner I've been running my whole life I do a lot of um, coaching in central London but since becoming a mum I've kind of shifted a lot of my direction into doing that online coaching as well so I worked for quite a while with Joe Wicks the body coach on his app and delivered a pre and postnatal um, coaching like platform or program on his app and then now I kind of do that for my own clients as well so yeah all things running and all things like um, pregnancy and mum related is my thing. Take me a little bit um back in your past then because you said you've always been a runner where did that start and how has that kind of manifested itself over the years so I think I've always been a really energetic child I'm one of four I have three brothers and we're all very close in age so there's about like four years between all four of us um and my mum was really active and she obviously played a huge part in my upbringing and kind of introduction into sport um and then my first kind of introduction I suppose into that formalized sport was gymnastics so me and my brothers we all did gymnastics when we were younger and I feel like a lot of children do as well like even my daughter she's nearly two and she already does gymnastics like it's quite a common thing to do even just for fun but we kind of started to take it a bit more seriously and I did a few gymnastics competitions but I always knew that it wasn't really my thing I enjoyed challenging myself and I suppose that was like my first introduction to being coached but I was like between four years old and 10. So it's quite young, I think, to be um, coached in that way. So that was a really good introduction for me to understand how to move my body, how to listen to a coach, how to compete. Um, but I didn't really find my thing. When I was in school, I knew that I was a fast runner because, you know, obviously at lunch break, you're always like playing on the playground. Um, and I used to play it with my friends or tag or whatever. And I used to run and I, I just noticed like, oh, I'm actually really fast. Um, but and all my brothers were the same. Um, but I just kind of didn't really think too much of it until my mum took us to this athletics club when I was about eight. And that just changed everything, I suppose. Then athletics kind of became my whole identity until I was in my 20s. Um, and I used to compete every weekend up and down the country and like sprinting and high jump and hurdles. They were my main things. And I think a lot of my identity in adolescence and, and throughout childhood was then formed through running. Um, and yeah, I just kept it going um, all throughout my like GCSEs, A-levels, university. And then I just made the decision at the end of uni to kind of take a step back from the competitive world and, and take it a bit less seriously, I suppose. Um, but yes, yeah, so my introduction to it was literally from when I was a child. Um, my mum like made it a big goal of hers to get us all into sport and thankfully it's stuck and, um, and I'm still doing it in some way now. So yeah, it's been a, been a special journey. That competitive side of things, was that something that you always had growing up, do you think? And do you still have that now? Yeah, I do think so. Um, and it's quite funny because I think if you're competitive, it has like connotations a lot of the time in society with being quite like confident and just like taking things really seriously and that, and that sort of um, energy. But actually in my day to day life, I'm like the total opposite to that. I'm like very sensitive. You know, I don't compare myself to other people at all. But when it comes to sport, there's just something about it that I really do just want to work hard and try hard and not necessarily beat other people but just do the absolute best for myself I think that was always my intention but I don't know if it was kind of having brothers such close age like my younger brothers are a year younger than me and they're twins and they were obviously fast and I me as the only girl I think it was important for me to prove to them like oh just because <laughs> your boys you can't be faster than me and we'd always be racing and competing at every opportunity so I don't know if it was growing up in that sort of environment um but also I just think in my family 
um, we were obviously praised when we were trying hard and doing well. So it kind of became a lot of my um, my goal and my mission to perform well, um, which was a great thing. But also then when I kind of became older and I had the added pressure of other things in life, like studying and relationships and tra- like moving away for university and things, to keep up that level of competition throughout those life changes it can be quite tough um so I think that in the end that's why I decided to take a step back and and kind of shift from that competitive world into um running for fun but actually it's it's kind of still quite hard for me to do that because I've I've still got that little bit inside of me that's like oh but you know you could go a little bit faster you could go a little bit further but it's been an interesting journey trying to make that transition I was going to ask that actually like what has that transition been like and how is it sort of just running quote unquote for fun? Yeah, it's definitely been a journey and I think it's something that I'll always be working through um, because even now that I, I tell myself and I tell other people that I'm running for fun, I am always looking for the next challenge and the next goal. So obviously my background is sprinting on the track really short distances like you know 100 up to 400 max um but then now I've kind of turned my sights on the longer distances and um I'm gonna aim to do the London Marathon next year and even though I'm running for fun when I like told my friends and stuff that I was gonna um, sign up for it in my head I was like yeah and I want to make sure that I do it in you know this particular time and I'm like oh I'm still bringing that kind of competitive side of me like into it and still wanted to perform even though I'm trying to shift my goal um but I think for me throughout university I realized that it isn't always the healthiest to be crazily competitive like for, for your mental health I suppose and I had so many other things that I was trying to achieve I was trying to I was already coaching so I was trying to build like a, a strong coaching business and a coaching platform I was then also really dedicated to my studies and I was trying to make sure I perform well in my um, academic life and then also to try and compete to a high level and at the time I was actually like a, a dual athlete because I was running but I was also doing rowing for my university um, because I, I learned how to row in school and I did some GB junior stuff and trying to keep that all up and keep that level of competition and try, I suppose trying to perform to a high level in all areas of my life it just started to take away from my life in a way and I feel like sport and exercise is obviously supposed to like add to your life and and bring more joy and more fun and more fulfillment but it did start to make me a bit more anxious a bit more stressed a bit more overwhelmed and I just really had to think what am I doing this for and one of my goals was always to go to the Olympics and when I realized like mm, don't think that's completely likely at this point you know I was I was doing well but I wasn't quite at that level so I was like why don't I just let go of of the need to try and win all the time and see what joy I can find in um, just doing it for fun? And I think a lot of my clients were the ones who showed me how to do it in that way because I was teaching fitness classes for what um, would be described as, you know, like everyday gym goers. And I could see them really trying hard, having fun, showing up, committing, but not trying to be in the Olympics. And I was like you guys are inspiring me because I'm, I'm looking at you. I'm, I'm your coach, but I'm looking at you and realizing that actually there is a life beyond just wanting to win and be at the top end of elite sport. Um, and I just think I learned, yeah, from, from the people I was coaching actually um, to let go of that expectation that you have to be the best. And once I got past that, I think it actually opened up doors for me because I tried out different sports. So I started playing football at uni completely for fun. I was in like the second team. I really didn't care about winning. And I just think I found a lot more fun and a lot more like joy um, when I let go of always trying to be the best. (laughs) Now being a mum, what are the lessons that you'll teach your daughter kind of that sport's given you over the years? And maybe what are the lessons that you've learned that maybe you won't pass on if that makes sense yeah no it does that's a really good question it's something that I think about quite a lot actually especially because I'm obviously a fitness lover coach like sport is my whole career but then also my partner and so my daughter's dad is is the same and he does the same thing and he loves sport as well and I'm quite conscious to make sure that we're not 
too overbearing and put too much pressure and be too much like pushy parents on her because I want her to enjoy the benefits of movement but equally if she wants to be musical or if she wants to be creative then I just want to give her the freedom just because I'm sporty and he's sporty I I don't want to force that upon her um because there were times in my journey where I felt a little bit trapped and obviously I was like in these kind of GB trial systems and um I got sports scholarship to my school so it kind of felt like well I can never quit sport because I got into my school because of my sport so you know it kind of did make me feel a bit trapped I don't want to make her feel like that so I definitely want to make her feel like she has options I'm at the moment encouraging her into a lot of sports I mean she's only two um so it's early days but she already does gymnastics ballet football and you know all of these ones just because I want her to just explore and find her groove but I think in terms of the lessons I'd love her to try and stick at it because I think I learned a lot of discipline um you know motivation determination all of those at qualities um even like timekeeping pushing through challenging times um her learning how to manage your mindset a lot of that I learned through sport so I would love her to um yeah dedicate her a portion of her life to sport um as she gets older but I think it's important for me to make sure that it doesn't take over her life and it's not the only thing that she does I know that for me competitive sport as a junior I couldn't go to a lot of parties and a lot of social events and I just I feel like I missed out on quite a lot of life and although it doesn't sound that important you know being like oh a party you know it's not the end of the world but it's It is an important part of growing up. And I think, you know, I I didn't get to experience that fully because I was so dedicated to to my sport. I want her to have a better balance and I definitely don't want her to experience overwhelm. So there were moments where I'd be at the track or down at the boat club in rowing and I'd be like super anxious, like almost, you know, having like panic attacks because I'd have um, a trial coming up at the weekend and I had to achieve a certain like score but then I also had my teachers on my back you know needing all my homework in on time and it was just so much pressure for somebody that's like 13 14 years old just trying to figure out life I definitely don't want her to go through that because I don't think that taught me the resilience or you know the work ethic that sometimes we think that it would I think it actually just taught me that actually life's a bit overwhelming sometimes <laughs> so yeah I think just balance is the key that that's the key lesson that I want her to to learn do it but only if it's bringing joy and fun into your life in terms of where you are now obviously you said that your baby girl's two years old how has it been that balance between mum life and you know doing that professional life which I know you're still hugely passionate on pursuing and sport life you know that fitness journey and that fitness side of you that's incredibly important that is hell of a balancing act yeah you describe it perfectly a balancing act for sure and it's one that often it feels like you're spinning a lot of plates and at one point one of them just has to drop like you just can't keep it all going um it's it's an ongoing process for sure I think in the first year I had the expectation that you know I'd I'd give birth and then I'd have a few months you know to recover and then I'd be back to it especially because I'm you know, my own coach, I work for myself. I was like, yeah, I can get back on coaching all my clients. I'm going to get back into more my running. And I just thought everything was going to be, you know, rainbows and fairies. But actually, the reality, it was quite a challenging, um, yeah, wake up call, I suppose, that I needed a little bit more time to figure it out. And now looking back, I'm so glad that I took that time because when you have a little one, they're, so, they're little for such a short amount of time. Like, they're small until they're about four and then they're off to school and then you can work more and train more and do all these things. So I actually appreciate the fact that I did take a little bit longer and really embrace her first years of life, but it didn't come without its challenges. And it's something that I spoke about a lot on my social media um, platform because I have a lot of mums in my um, community. And it's just something that we're always facing, trying to hold on to that identity that you had before you know thinking of yourself as a hard worker maybe you're an entrepreneur or business owner um maybe you train multiple times in the gym but then also you've got this whole new identity as a mum that does take up 99 percent of your time and that you want to dedicate all your time to as well um but then equally you don't want to lose all the other parts of you so it's kind of trying to navigate how you're going to piece those bits into your life and i think for me it just was a whole um I suppose 
like restructuring of how I think about movement. So before I would think, right, I've got a gap in between all my clients and classes. I've got 90 minutes, going to go to the gym, do a lovely 20 minute warm up, and then, you know, do, do it exactly how I would kind of coach my clients to do it. Um, but since becoming a mum, I was like, right, 20 minute home workouts, you know, no equipment or just one pair of dumbbells or even having her strapped to my chest so that I could just do it. What if she was upset, if I was putting her down, like you just have to figure out how to overcome those barriers and let go of the idea that exercise is really structured. It takes a long time. It's really formalized. It has to, you know, follow this exact formula and just, um, I suppose embrace the chaos. That's what I learned. Like sometimes I'd plan to do a workout at 6am that wouldn't happen. I'd end up doing it at 10 PM or sometimes I think, right, I'm going to do a dumbbell workout, but she's upset. So I would have her on my arm the whole time, just doing my lunges and my squats like that. Or, you know, my glute bridges with her sat on my lap and just, I suppose like embracing that that's all part of the, the journey and the experience and kind of, yeah, just accepting that it's not going to look the same because there was a lot of time that I was clinging on to that idea that, oh, but I should be in the gym. I should be doing this many reps and sets and everything. And it's not going to look like that. Um, so yeah, just kind of leaning into the the change of pace and the the yeah change that motherhood brings and doing what you can with what you have. That's, that's kind of the process that I've been through. And even now that she's older, I'm still going through that journey now. What is that process of acceptance like? Because I guess when you're becoming... A parent I'm not a parent myself so I, I can't speak on it but I guess there must be that huge realization of I am responsible for this person now and this is the biggest part of my life and accepting yeah. that must be quite difficult initially yeah absolutely I think even for the first year I would look around and be like I'm a mum I'm your mum like you're gonna call me mum like this is so crazy <laughs> like but it's just that yeah it's been the best experience ever it's so much like parenthood is so much better than I could have imagined but also harder than I could have imagined at the same time and I think going into it when I was pregnant I read all the books I did all the you know online courses and everything to get myself prepared but it is like what you what they say that until you're in it you can't really prepare yourself and it's it's definitely a learn on the job sort of thing um but for me I just had to yeah the process of acceptance I suppose is for me I had to really sit down and almost write down and journal what it is that I prioritize most right now and what can be in the back seat and I think for me I love sports so much and I loved training and I it's, it's such a big part of me but ultimately me wanting to be present for my daughter was above that. So that had to come first for me. And that's not the experience that everybody has. And that's totally fine. Um, you know, I know I have mum friends and I know a lot of people online as well, where, you know, their training or their work or their, you know, anything that they do does come first and that's totally fine. But I think it's really important to reflect and understand what it is that you care about most and is important to you most because then you just have to stack your priorities in that order so for me I had to think right all of her needs obviously are, are the most important thing and then beyond that I wanted to spend extra time with her so I didn't put her in nursery or anything like that that was my own decision so I had to think right I've decided that I'm not going to put her in child care because I want to I want all the cuddles that I could possibly get so now how do I um plan my movement and my training and the other things I love around it and part of that looked like like I was saying training with her um you know I'd bring her to classes I did mum and baby classes where I'd bring her but also the other mums would bring their little babies as well and I'd host a workout for everyone I also bought a jogging buggy which for me was like so instrumental in my running journey because it meant that I could run she was sat in the buggy. She was getting fresh air, looking around, enjoying the scenery. Um, so that was a win-win. Um, and I think it's just an ongoing process of being grateful for what I have. The fact that I do have a happy, healthy daughter. I've always wanted to be a mum. And that, you know, this phase that I'm in isn't going to last forever. At one, at one point, she's going to go off to uni or whatever she wants to do. Or she's going to be 10 years old and uh, sleep over with her friends. And I'm going to have all the time in the world. But right now... I just have to accept and understand that this phase that I'm in, 
are going to be a bit tired, sleep deprived. She's going to need me a lot and it's not going to last forever. So just like rolling with the punches, I think that was really important, but it is a daily practice. There's so many times where I think, oh, she's going to nap at this time. So I'm going to train and then it doesn't happen. And that frustration can build and you can feel like disappointment and, you know, longing for your, you know, how easy it used to be. But then you just return back to the priorities and back to kind of the decisions that you've made and why you're doing it. And just, yeah, keeping that why at the core of what you're doing, I think, has helped me to accept for sure. In terms of, you know, from a coaching perspective, has it given you a greater appreciation of of what people go through on a day to day and and kind of like what what you can offer new mums and mums that have been mums for a while too yeah absolutely and to be honest even to people who aren't parents as well I think when I was a coach before having my daughter being pregnant I was kind of in this bubble so I was studying for my undergrad and my master's and I was working but other than that I didn't really have any responsibilities anything else like pulling me in different directions yes I was working and studying but actually it was quite a nice balance and you know I had a really good relationship with sport and food and I just yeah I I suppose I didn't really have that much life experience in a way so when clients would come to me and say you know I was struggling to find the time um you know I'm lacking in energy I'm lacking in motivation I could offer my best but it's almost like I hadn't had that lived experience. Whereas now going through that process, it's like, I actually get you. I really get you firsthand because I'm also going through it as well. So I think it's just added a layer of like empathy. Um, So the resources that I look for and, and the infographics I create, I suppose are a lot more centered around making movement accessible within the challenges and the barriers that we experience in life whereas I suppose before I perhaps approached it a bit more like we all live in this like really easy world and you know we don't have any responsibilities and everything's fine and now I definitely get that you know mums that are working mums or stay-at-home mums or or dads or you know whatever it is we all have um, so many different things like fighting for our attention and it isn't easy to make time to exercise um, and so now I think I have a lot more of a person-centered approach and a lot more of an understanding and even from the pregnancy perspective obviously being pregnant myself I do I, I suppose I sympathize and relate with a lot of the experiences that my prenatal clients are having um, so some of the advice that I can give is a lot more um, personal as well which is a really nice experience. Um, And it just kind of, I suppose it's like I'm learning on the job with them because like I was saying, I'm I'm constantly working through that acceptance um, for myself on my own journey. And then I can impart a little bit of that experience of wisdom onto my clients as well, especially the prenatal ones who are are kind of yet to experience, I suppose. So it's just, I suppose it's added a layer of depth to my coaching for sure. And it's opened my eyes up to the realities of life, like whether you're a parent or not, being able to to commit to movement and exercise with all of the demands that we've got it's not easy so um yeah it's it's been a learning process but I think becoming a parent has definitely helped me become a better coach in that way something else that you share really well on your social is yes the the motherhood side of things but you also talk a lot about women's sport and women in competitive sport yeah from somebody that's competed at a high level kind of throughout their throughout their journey really throughout their athletic journey what are the changes you've seen from when you were a kid competing at those levels to where we are now and how do you see kind of the coverage of women's sport going in the future oh it's it's like a world of difference and I'm I'm 27 now and I'd say that I was kind of in the peak of my competitive journey around like 17 18 sort of time so we're only talking about 10 years ago um but the the growth has just been so rapid and it's so inspiring to see because when I was younger um even in school playing football wasn't an option like it wasn't even something that you could choose to do it was like netball hockey lacrosse um tennis like you know those sorts of things um and so I I think I just played football as a one-off once um like some sort of club And I came home to my mom and I said, oh, I loved it. Like, you know, it's running, but also it's like skill based as well. This is amazing. And my mom was like, you are not doing another sport. Like (laughs) you're already doing too many things, which was the right decision to be fair. But at the time she was also like, there's no 
future for women's sport, um, women's football. Like there's there's nothing really going on. Like women's football is, you know, they have to um they have to work. I saw it. Yeah, when I was younger, I saw a um snippet on the news. I think, and it was about how the I might have been Tottenham ladies, and they were working like two other jobs whilst um you know training and and competing just to be able to support their football. And then fast forward to now where you see that women's football and obviously women's sport in general is finally getting the recognition that it deserves and, you know, a lot more coverage, playing in stadiums that we deserve to be in, getting the spectators that we deserve to to kind of play in front of and, and perform in front of. It is amazing to see, but it, part of it feels like, you know, it's about time, like, you know, we yeah. should have had this anyway especially in football, because if you look at the history of women's football, we were competing just like the men, like way, way back. And then we were banned from playing for, you know, a considerable amount of time. And that obviously inhibited our ability to compete. And I think now women's football, especially is starting to get the the growth that it deserves. And I remember like 10 years ago, hearing my like male friends saying oh you know women's football they're so you know they're not good at this and they're not good at that and there was such a stigma around it and I suppose a comparison between the men's and the women's teams always and we just couldn't shake that off whereas now I think I don't know if it's the rise of you know sports media and social media as well but it just seems to be becoming its own entity and I'm so glad because women's sport doesn't need to be compared to men's sport like we can both be amazing at sport we're not competing against each other we can exist in our own right and we can do well and we can achieve and you know the women's players can get um you know the funding and the support that they deserve I was actually speaking to I went to an event and it was at West Ham FC so I was speaking to some of the pro um, female ballers there and they were saying for them the most important thing is that all of this kind of success and and growth that we're seeing in women's sport gets passed down into the grassroots system to just make sure that younger players um of of any sport especially girls are being encouraged to continue in sport um because something that we see a lot in women's sport is that when girls get to around 14 years old they tend to drop off in sport and it's usually a lot to do with body confidence and obviously changes in um hormones and you know menstrual cycle and all these things um girls often lose a lot of confidence in sport so i think a lot of the pro players are really passionate about making sure that yes, we're seeing all these amazing things happen in women's sport and it's so great, but we need to feed that back into the young girls and make sure that they're feeling confident and comfortable to continue. And then the sport will just keep growing. And yeah, it's it's so exciting. And I think all of us, well, everyone, men, women, like whatever you identify yourself as, we should be rooting for women's sport because it's, it's been a long time coming and it's a very exciting, um, time i suppose to be spectating and, and being a part of it so yeah and it's amazing like seeing some of the crowds at some of the games like i'm a welsh football fan and nice. seeing them and rooting for them to try and qualify for the comp like euros and worlds and stuff like that it's like it's been amazing and talking to like friends of mine that are family have got families as well the kind of idea that a lot of them are taking their kids to football matches now yeah. where they would never have in the past gone to a male football match maybe just because of you know some of the traditional stuff that maybe goes on they feel way more comfortable taking them to yeah. like these like women's super, super league games or whatever and and that's really cool absolutely it is so cool and it's nice that we can kind of create this positive environment where it does feel like a family affair and you can kind of um your passion for the sport whether you're a spectator or you take part in it yourself you can kind of um bring your children along and involve them in the process and they can be part of the experience and and be part of you know watching this um entity i suppose that like, grow in front of us it's really cool and obviously we know that bringing your children if you have them or, or relatives or friends you know younger kids um into that sporting world is super inspiring for them and you know will encourage them themselves to participate in sport and I suppose reap all the benefits that movement and sport in general has in life so yeah I think it's it's really exciting a really cool time I know you're not in it in a competitive sense now but from a broadcasting point of view I know you're doing a lot at the moment you've hosted panels at um, the London Marathon Expo you are doing work for Traxter you're doing loads of different work obviously working for yourself as well sharing everything on your socials even though you're not in it in a competitive level, 
does it feel nice to be in it and pushing it forward from a perspective of of what you're doing Oh, a hundred percent. I think this was such an important step for me um, because in the beginning, it's almost like I kind of went cold turkey and stepped out of that competitive world and was just, you know, doing my own gym training and focusing on my business and things. And that was great. And I think I needed to have that break, but I then started to miss it. And I thought, how can I kind of return to the sport and have that connection with the sport without actually being the athlete myself? And um, especially because the, with the demise of motherhood, it's just not something that I... I'm passionate about enough obviously to be a competitive athlete you have to sacrifice a lot and I think I'm kind of in this stage where I prioritize you know my daughter over everything so I just wasn't in that space to return as an athlete and that's when I thought you know to go into the world of um, broadcasting and presenting and just have that connection with the sport and be involved in the sport but just from a different perspective and it's been such an incredible process because I get to chat to all these athletes and hear their amazing stories and and I suppose be inspired by them um, but also yeah share their journey um and also just kind of help to shape the narrative, I suppose, of particularly women's sport. And just kind of, you know, in the past, I think in sports media, women's sport has been done a disservice. So um, in my undergrad, I did linguistics and a lot of what we studied was about kind of the way that um, people are represented in the media. And You can see a lot of comparisons of male athlete and a female athlete. And the male athlete will get asked questions about their performance and about their training. And a woman, a female athlete, sorry, would get asked questions about um, what they're wearing and, and kind of the more aesthetic based questions that have nothing to do with their ability and their performance or what they're there to do and I suppose being in the position where I'm on you know hosting the panels and I'm talking to these incredible female athletes that are so um yeah powerful formidable and what they're doing is so interesting and their stories are amazing and to really prioritize the story rather than anything any of the fluff I suppose that that in the past they would have been asked that it just really isn't that relevant you know or even comments about their body size or shape or changes in their physique is just absolutely not relevant or not necessary so I think I've kind of come into it wanting to also push the conversation forwards and um, yeah be connected to the sport but also to just have a tiny part in in improving the um the way that women's sport or just sport in general is spoken about I suppose and um, obviously we were both working together at the night of the 10,000 meter TVs which was such an incredible night um, of you know athletics performance and it was just so amazing to be there on the track but just to have a different role and it just felt really special for me to to still be immersed in the sport and I did think to myself little like eight-year-old me down on the track I, I think she would be proud that I was still involved in the sport but that I had just kind of yeah shifted my focus to more um sharing the stories of others so yeah it's, it's been an amazing process. Do you think having been in that story as well has helped you kind of understand how you can help people share their story because you've kind of been in it you understand what a lot of these people have been through I'd like to think so because I have had a range of experiences with sport so in athletics I think I had a smoother level of success I think I had quite a few years where I was winning pretty much every race I entered or every event I did and it was kind of it almost felt a little bit too good to be true because, yeah. you know, it just it just felt quite smooth and quite easy. And then it was only as I got to being a little bit older, so 14, and when I started rowing as well, that became more challenging because I was doing – rowing is quite an, a fairly endurance-based sport, but then sprinting is obviously power, speed. And then it kind of started to become more challenging because I was shifting my focus into two completely different areas and disciplines. Um, so that became more challenging. And I suppose I started to have more hiccups in um, in my athletics experience and I started to experience some mental blocks. So I'd run up to, so I was doing high jump and run up to the bar ready to jump and it'd be a, a height that I cleared in training multiple times, but I just stop literally in front of everybody in the arena, just freeze. And then the official would be like, okay, you need to try again. You have a certain amount of minutes to try again before you're, you know, you kind of get out, I suppose. And I would just, I was starting to face some mental challenges in, in my athletics world, but then also in my rowing world, some races will be amazing. And, you know, I trained really hard and I performed better than expected, but then some races, um, 
was super challenging and I didn't get the result I wanted. And I vividly remember I was being sat after a race with my coach and this was a GB trial. I think it was like right towards the end. So just before you're about to get selected for a boat um, to go to Worlds. Um, and me and my teammate, we just unexpectedly just didn't really perform as well as we wanted to. And I remember my coach and she was amazing, but she was like quite a realist. She sat down with us. She was like, okay, I know you're probably feeling disappointed and you should be disappointed. It wasn't a good performance, blah, blah, blah. And you just, I felt so awful. And it's just that experience of having the highs of winning and having all the medals around your neck and just feeling quite like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. This is all going really well. But then also those those lows of like, oh God, I've just been told that I should be disappointed about my performance. Like this is this is quite rubbish, you know, just, <laughs> just to have those range of experiences and emotions in sport. I'd like to think that kind of going through that myself I can understand when I'm um, ra- um, interviewing racers, especially like post race, and some of them have done amazing, and they've got all you know the, the post runners high that everyone talks about, and they're excited, and they've just got a personal best, and they're about to um, you know qualify for the Europeans or something. But then also the ones that have been training really hard, and you know it hasn't gone to plan, or they're coming back from injury, and just having you know, there's such a range of emotions and experiences involved in sport. And I think having done it myself, I'd like to think I can, I can empathize and therefore um, relate to the athletes a little bit more. And I suppose it comes off a little bit more authentically because I've, I've been in it myself in in some way. Yeah. So I'd like to think so. (laughs) We'll finish with this Courtney. Um, But I think it would be remiss if I didn't ask you, if somebody's listening to this now and they're, they're going, you know, they're, going into their own journey of motherhood or fatherhood or you know just into a family journey and they're thinking to themselves similar to what you were feeling you know in in those times I don't know how I'm gonna go into this and kind of lose that part of my identity when it comes to athletics movement training what would be your your main piece of advice to them and, and how would you go about offering kind of a hand to kind of say you know it will be all right but it is maybe a bit bit challenging yeah so my main piece of advice it might sound negative but it's actually not negative is to lower your expectations um because if you go into parenthood expecting that you're going to strike this perfect balance from the start and you're going to have enough time for your five you know gym sessions or run sessions or whatever it is and then you're also going to have enough time to show up as an incredible parent and you're also going to sleep through the night and you're also you know all of these things if you have that expectation it is likely that you're going to at some point fall short from it and feel the disappointment i think it's easier if you go into it and say right what is the bare minimum that I want to achieve? Is it three runs a week? Maybe you should do five. Is it three runs you want to get done? Okay, how are you going to um, structure your life and make sure that you've kind of um, had conversations with a support system around you to enable that to happen? I think starting from what your absolute baseline is that you need to feel connected with, you know, that other part of you, whether it's sport and related or or another hobby entirely, um, you need to yeah just find that minimum and then shoot higher but at the very least you're gonna you're gonna be able to strike that balance at least whereas I think I initially went into it thinking I'm still going to be able to achieve all of these things and then I had to learn the hard way you know so I do say to my clients I it is possible to achieve a very well-rounded balanced life that involves all of the things that you love and that you're passionate about but you just need to make sure that you're setting your expectations appropriately you're setting realistic goals that work for you in your new phase of life maybe you used to run um, and compete in Ironmans before but maybe now you just want to do like some sprint races instead because you don't have the time to dedicate to the training or maybe you just want to do park runs for the time being it's just a phase that you're in it's not going to last for a lifetime so change those expectations really get clear on what your goals are and just work from there do what you can with the time and energy and the resources that you have and just make sure that you're having fun with it you know don't take it too seriously it is just a small period of time and then you're gonna when when your kids get bigger you're gonna have a lot more time and things are gonna shift so just roll with it and do your best that's that's all the advice that i can give (laughs) 